If you would, grab your Bibles. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians today. Um, we're going to be looking at leadership. So Paul, as he writes this book to the church at Thessalonica, he starts off talking about the gospel, specifically how the gospel impacts the life of the believer. And the reason I believe he starts with this as he talks about the impact that the gospel has had on the church at uh, Thessalonica and their short time how they've been existing is because the entire book is about trying to, to show how we are to live in light ultimately of the return of Christ. That's what the book's about. So as he starts, he starts with the gospel. The gospel has impacted their life. It's changed them. It's made them new people. And now as we move into chapter 2, what you're going to see is more specifically, he's going to, you're going to see how the gospel has impacted his life, and you're going to see the example of his leadership. And so today I've titled this sermon, The Essence of Godly Leadership, because now he's going to get more personal. He's going to, if we're going to live in light of Jesus' return, each of us has a part to play. And believe it or not, believe it or not, you are both leader and follower in all of your spheres of influence. Did you know that? You may not think of yourself as a leader, but you are. At every turn, at some point throughout your day, you're leading or you're following. And I always say that great, great leaders first become great followers. They learn how to submit. They learn how to subject themselves to other people. And as we grow in Christ, our leadership, believe it or not, that influence begins to expand. It begins to grow. And so what we're going to see today is Paul is going to explain this concept of what it means to be a godly leader. Specifically, not just a good leader, but a godly leader. Now, each of us probably has someone in mind. If I were to say, look back on your life, name somebody that you know that is a godly leader, you probably have somebody. Maybe you don't recognize it. Maybe you aren't thinking about it. Maybe you're going, well, I don't know. There's probably somebody in your life who, who led, whether it was a coworker, whether it was a parent, whether it was a boss at work, whether it was a family member, a neighbor. We all probably have a person's name that we can put in mind that we think there was something different about that guy. He wasn't just, he didn't just lead us, but he sacrificed for us. And there's going to be certain characteristics that we're going to see today as we walk through this that are of godly leaders. I remember uh, some of the greatest men that impacted my life were godly leaders, specifically in the area of athletics. I was really fortunate to have some godly men, men who love the Lord, coach me through junior high and into high school. Um, and so I, was, I had these great examples of what, what is, it's almost like Christ in the flesh right here. So what I want us to do today as we look at this, I want you to be thinking not only about the people in your life that you can go, oh man, what he's describing here is this guy, but I also want you to be thinking about yourself. I want you to be internalizing, see these things and going, is this me? Am I doing this? Because what you're going to see today is not only the things that are good, but we're going to see a lot of the things that Paul says, we don't do this. And we're going to be able to look at both sides of it, okay? So look at your text. We're going to start with verse 1 of chapter 2. And the first couple of verses as we go through this, Paul is setting himself up. So read verse 1 with me if you would. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Okay, so in other words, it was not in futility. When Paul entered into Thessalonica, we're going to kind of talk how he got there. Um, the whole process was under extreme persecution. And once he left that city, he was, I, I believe, looking back through the book of Acts and looking at the, uh, his books uh, to the Thessalonians, uh, I believe he was kind of doubtful. I, kind of, I think that he was looking back on them going, I don't know. I don't know if anything we did there was going was, to was set in or, or stick. Okay, so when he says this, he's saying, when we came to you, it was not in vain. Our short time, the time that we were with you, God greatly multiplied that effort. Look at verse 2. He says, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. And now, what he's talking about here can be found in Acts chapter 16 and in Acts chapter 17. 
And what I'm going to do real briefly is give you a little, a little uh, uh, catch you up on some things. So in Acts chapter 16, at the beginning of chapter 16, Paul uh, launches into what is known as his second missionary journey. And he and Silas leave uh, through Antioch. They go north. They go across what is now today Turkey. And as they're going across Turkey, they meet a young man named Timothy. They come to the city of Lystra. You guys have heard of Timothy. First and second Timothy is Paul's writing to this guy, Timothy. He ultimately becomes the leader of the church at Ephesus. Well, they pick this guy up. He's like, he's a, he's a young kid. He's a believer, just came to know the Lord. And as they're moving, they move into what's known as Asia. It's kind of the western half of Turkey, all right? And as they're getting there, Paul gets, uh, he just, the Lord speaks to him and says, don't share a word here. So he's almost, uh, he's prohibited from speaking the gospel to any of the churches in Asia. Any of the churches that they previously had started over there, he says, don't go there. And God leads him to the city of Troas. And as he's there, he has a vision. And in that vision, he sees a man calling him, come over, come over to us. Come across the sea, come speak to us. And it's what's known as the Macedonian call. And he all gathers his boys and says, hey, we're going across, we're going to Europe. So they cross the sea, get over uh, into northern Greece, what's today would be northern Greece. And the first place they stop is the city of Philippi. And that's what he's talking about here. Just to give you a, a quick illustration. When they get to Philippi, the first person they meet, they start talking, sharing the, the, the word of the Lord, and they meet a woman named Lydia. And Lydia is a pretty wealthy lady. She sells uh, 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 kind of uh, fabrics, purple fabrics is what they say, and they're very expensive. The whole process of making things purple was a costly process. It was for uh, upper-end people, so to speak, rich people. And so she's a wealthy lady. They meet her. They share the gospel with her. She believes. She trusts in Christ. And then she convinces them to come and stay with her at her house. And so Paul, Timothy, and Silas go and they stay with her. And as they're preaching the gospel in Philippi, they go around and, and there's, they keep kind of passing this one area. And this woman, this slave girl, keeps following them, yelling, these men are following the Lord most high. These men. And, and, and just kind of, spouting out just confession that these men are of God. Well, after a while, it begins to annoy Paul, and he turns to her and he realizes that she's not doing this on her own volition. She's got a spirit in her. She's got a demon that's compelling her, and it's the demon in her that is, 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 is being forced to recognize his, his maker. And so he turns to the slave girl, and he casts this demon out of her. Well, unfortunately... Well, let me back up. Fortunately, the demon was helping this girl to tell people's fortunes. And she was a slave, so she was making money for her owners. Well, of course, that made them mad, right? Now this girl, she's not telling fortunes anymore. She's not making any more money. They go to the city officials. They say, these guys are against the Roman government. We got to take them out. They grab them. They beat them with rods. Do you guys remember several years back when that kid got caned in, I think it was Indonesia? Where was it, Singapore? Yeah. Whoo! They get caned. Then they get thrown in jail and they're, they're chained to the floor of the jail. And this is where you have this famous verses of Scripture where Paul and Silas, they're singing in the prison, right? In Philippi. They're singing. Earthquake happens. Chains come off. Jailer wakes up, about to cut his own throat. They say, whoa, we're, stop, we're all here, nobody's left. The jailer realizes this, something different about this guy. He falls on his knees, you guys have what I need. What must I do to, to experience what you're experiencing? You're singing, you haven't left. So they tell him about Jesus. He comes to Christ, uh, takes him back to their house. He starts to care for their wounds. Paul and, Silas and Timothy lead uh, uh, their enti his entire family to the Lord. And the jailer's like, we got to get you out of town. He says, no, what they did was illegal. I'm a Roman. You can't beat me. Not without a trial anyway. I want to talk to the governor. I want to talk to the city officials. So they, okay, take him before the city officials. The city officials go, oh, we could be in a lot of trouble. Please, 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 please don't, don't, don't get us in trouble. Please don't get us in trouble. Shares Christ with the city's officials, and then they leave. They leave Philippi. And you got to think, when they left Philippi, it wasn't weeks, months later when they were healed. They left Philippi 
with the open wounds on their back, and they headed down the road to the next city, which was Thessalonica. Now, when they get to Thessalonica, Thessalonica had a thriving Jewish community, so they didn't just go in the streets. They went right to the synagogues because that's what Paul most of the time did. He started with the Jewish community and then went out into the Gentile community. He, so he will, goes to the synagogue where he knows he can speak openly about God, gain some trust. He actually converts some rabbinical uh, teachers to the Lord and in doing so begins to cause a division in the Jews. And now you've got these Jews who are messianic, trusting in Christ. You've got some that aren't. And the ones, as they're seeing their brothers, they're seeing their, their fellow men follow after this Jesus, they begin to get jealous. And they start to go after them. Well, one of these rabbinical teachers was a guy named Jason. And Jason converts, has Paul and Silas into, their, into his house, just like Lydia, taking care of them, and... These Jews come around, they grab Jason and take him and put him in jail. And what ultimately happens in Thessalonica is Jason, they couldn't get Paul, so they had the next best thing, this, their buddy. And he says, in order for Jason to go free, in order for us to not punish him, you got to get Paul out of town. We don't want him anywhere near this place. And so they basically make Jason sign, uh, or it's almost like a bond, they bonded him out, and in order to bond out of, of, of jail, they had to sign a pledge saying that we, that Paul and Silas will not come back to Thessalonica until this governorship, until the leaders of this city have turned over. That's basically what they did. So Paul and Silas take off. They go down to uh, Athens and then ultimately to Corinth, and that's how we get the book of uh, of. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is because while in Corinth, he writes back to the, the church at Thessalonica, and he sends Timothy with this book. And then Timothy brings back these replies, right? And so that's how we get the book. Now, listen to the, you know what he said? We came to you amidst much suffering and pain. There's still, I mean, don't you know that when he shows up, there's probably blood still pe uh, peeking through the back of his shirt, Hey, everybody, the Messiah has come. Dude, you need to go to a hospital, man. So through much pain and suffering, and then the opposition at Philippi, the opposition at Thessalonica. So when he's setting this up, he's, we have to know the details. We have to know the backstory a little bit. Because if you really, if we're going to look at leadership, specifically Paul's leadership, it paints a whole other picture, right? <clears throat> when you see what he had to go through for the gospel. So now let's look at verse 3. And we're going to answer three questions from this point out when it comes to godly leadership. And the first one is, Paul's going to explain the ambitions of godly leadership. So what are the ambitions of a godly leader? Okay, so we're all pretty ambitious at some levels. Most of us are. We all have goals that we set for ourselves, things we want to accomplish in our life. But when it comes to leadership that where men and women are stepping out on faith in Christ... There's, it, it, the leadership, the, the ambition gets separated from the self. It gets separated from the world. And so what we're going to see here is Paul's going to explain these ambitions in the negative. You're going to see him explain in the negative. So look at verse 3. The first thing you're going to see is not, the, a godly leader, godly leaders are not in it for falsehood. So let me, let me, let me give you a quote real quick. I want to share this with you. This comes from John MacArthur. He says, according to Scripture, virtually everything that truly qualifies a person for leadership directly relates to character. And if you ever want to find out a person's character in the midst of something, seek for their ambition. In other words, if you want to find a person's character in the midst of, of a circumstance, let's ask the question, what are you in it for? This is a great tool to use when voting for people when it comes to politics, right? What are you in it for? Because if you're going to be a public servant, what's your ambition? Because that will ultimately tell me what's going on in your soul, right? So that's what we say. So the first thing is, is godly leaders are not in it for falsehood. In other words, they're in it for truth. They're not in it for error. Look, error. Look at the text in verse 3. It says, For our exhortation does not come with, excuse me, come from error or impurity, or by the way of deceit. In other words, his leadership, what he's bringing, 
he's not bringing to them error. He's not bringing to them uh, there's this information. In the world of politics, there's a big term that's being passed around right now and that, and when it comes to the media and misinformation. It's this term, fake news, right? The idea that, wait a second, there could be a media outlet that's not in it for being honest, but they're in it to spin it. <gasps> that can't be. I mean, we do realize that the whole media organization is in it to make money, right? They're not in it necessarily for the virtues, although I do believe a lot of them are. I believe a lot of the, the, uh, the, the commentators and the, the, the men and women who are out there at least started off in a virtuous way. But there is this term now that's being passed around called fake news. It's the idea that somebody is spinning it to make it false, to twist it so that the wrong information gets passed around. And what Paul is saying, wait a second, that's not of God. If, if, we're in a, if that's coming from the church leaders, from the leaders uh, of our communities who are professing Christ, that's not of God. That's the first thing you see. So he says it's not a falsehood. The next one is, it, is their motives are not in it for favors. Look at the next little text in verse 4. Just as we have been approved by God and entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not pleasing men but God who examines our hearts. So what you see here is that they're not in it for, for favors. In other words, I use myself as, as an example. I'm not up here. I, I don't want you to not like me, okay? I don't want you to hate Chris Wilson. But I'm not necessarily up here in it to make you feel good. That would be pleasing men. And I, and I don't want you to walk away discouraged. I don't want you to walk away going, oh, man, that just, I just got punched in the face over and over and over. I want the word of God to examine your heart. I want God himself to, for you to sift yourself through his word and through who he is. But I also want you to like me. I want you to know that I love you and I'm for you. But what you see in a godly leader is you see that this person isn't in it to to gain favors with people. They're not just speaking things so that you'll like them and so that they can ultimately bend your ear and have you in their pocket. See what he's saying? Keep going. The next thing is flattery. Godly leaders are not in it for flattery. In verse 5, he said, For we never came to you with flattering speech. Why does a person speak flatteringly to someone else? By a why does a person do that? It's because, really, let's be honest. You ever gone and buy a car? You go to, if you're a car salesman, I love you. No, no, you have a gift, right? You have a skill. But you ever go to a car lot? What are they trying to do? They're trying to sell you a car, right? And what's the tactic that's most often used in these situations is flattery. If they can get you to feel good about yourself, they're going to get your trust, right? And the point of this is that as he's sharing the gospel, he's saying, I'm not trying to gain such an influence in your life that you're going to believe and trust in me. If a pastor or a teacher or a godly leader is up and he's just flattering you, it's more about him than it is about the word of God and about the truth. Does that make sense? So the idea is that it's not about flattery. Their, their motives are not bent in trying to not only make you feel good about yourself, but get you to now like me, be about me. Look at the next one. It's not in it for fraud. Now this is a pretty big deal. This is a pretty big deal. Look at the text. This is the second half of verse 5. He says, uh, not only uh, we, uh, for we came never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. The word pretext here is the word prophesis. It means to cloak or to hide or to conceal. Some of you right now may have a little prophesis going on. You maybe have a weapon on you. You have a concealed or a prophesis gun, Right? And the reason is, is because you don't want anybody to know what's really going on. It's a pretext for something. And the idea here is, he said, 
We never came to you with a pretext for greed. In other words, we didn't cloak what we were saying. We didn't hide what we were saying or conceal what we were saying just so that we could make money from you, just so we could sell a book. So I have a theory. It's just a theory. And um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of tele-evangelists, okay? There's a lot of stuff on TV that's really great. There's a lot of guys on TBN that, I mean, they speak some great truth. But I always say this. At, if at some point during that, 20, 30-minute time period, if they all of a sudden are trying to sell you something, I say, turn the channel. To me, I don't want to be up here saying, hey, let me, let's talk about the Word of God. Let's talk about Jesus. Oh, and by the way, I have a new book out. If I, I'm ready for you to get. Now, that's great if that's what I'm doing. If I'm in the world, if that's part of who I am, it's part of my business, is I... But, but for the pretext of the Lord, I just don't, I think that that's the idea of going, hey, I'm cloaking something. I'm going to get you in. I'm going to bait you so that you can, I'm going to get you to like me. I'm going I'm, I'm to do some favors for you. You do some favors for me. And then ultimately, I'm going to spin it. And that's what he's saying. This is not godly leadership, is it? Right? And keep going. Verse 6. And finally, he says, they're not in it for fame. Now, let me just tell you this. From a godly leader standpoint, this is the one crux for most godly leaders. Okay, look at the text. It says, "Nor did we speak, excuse me, nor did we seek glory from men." Stop right there for just a second. So uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, I'm going to pick on my seminary for a second. Well, no, I'm not going to pick on my seminary. I'm going to pick on some of the guys that I went to seminary with. Um. I sat in class with a lot of guys who are very godly men who are now out just the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord is using them to impact people's lives, to change lives. It's, it's incredible that, that what has come out of Dallas Seminary. Um, but at the same time, there were a lot of guys who came to seminary who were looking to be the next Matt Chandler, the next John Piper, the next Mark Dever. Now, I don't mean, know if you know who those guys are, but those guys are well-known Christian pastors. And men would go to seminary because they wanted that as opposed to this, as opposed to in it for the right reason. They were in it for fame. And here's the problem with this, okay? Okay. I want you to just to, let's just take a let's just take for just a second a snapshot of our surroundings right here. Okay? I'm standing here. You're sitting there. In this room, there's probably about 120 so folks sitting in here. Okay? You're all looking at me. You're all listening to me. During the week, I get we talk, we email, we text, we call. I, we go to lunch. You're seeking me out. How do you think that makes me feel? Pretty good. Right? I'm the most popular kid in school. Do you see where I'm going with this? This is a drug. What would you say? That's right. I got to have guys like Jeff constantly tell me how bad I am. It's great. <laughs> Spunky, always telling me how bad I stink. It's horrible. I'm a bad guy. Now, now, here's my point. This can go to a pastor's head very easily. And Paul says this. He says, I'm not in it for the glory of men. This is godly leadership. I say this to all my men around me. If you see me, and you begin to recognize this in me, you have to call it out. Because guess what? I'm going to do it to you. If I see it in you, I'm going to call you. If I see you in it for the wrong reasons, your motivation, your ambition is not for the right things, I'm going to call you. You have to do the same for me. You know why? Because if we don't, then what we build here is no different than Denton Country Club. 
with no impact. Not that the country club is bad, but it's just a bunch of people gathered together to make each other feel good, to have some fun, a little social interaction. We're not changing the world. We're not impacting anybody. If I'm just in it for me and you're just in it for you, we might as well just change the name of this. Call it Benchmark Bible Church. Call it the uh, Denton Social Community of Texas. I don't know. But that's not what's on our name. We are the church, right? We're in it for Christ. So now what I want to do is we're going to back up just a few verses here because we just have said the negative, right? We just said it's not for these things. Uh, the godly leader is not in it for these five things specifically. Now let's look at what he is in it for. He is in it for an audience of one. There's only one thing he cares about. There's only one person that he cares about. There's only one ambition motivating, ultimate goal. If we boil everything out and kick it all out the doors, there's one thing that the godly leader is in it for. And he says it three different times in verses 4 and 5. So I'll put it back on the screen for you. It says this, But just as we have been approved by God, so he's, the approval comes from the Lord, right? Keep going to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Verse 5, for we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor the pretext of greed. God is our witness. Who's watching this guy? Who's examining this guy? Who is this guy getting his approval from, his, his uh, strokes from, his uh, encouragement and exhortation are coming from who? Not from the world. Not from himself, his own ambition. He's in it for an audience of one. Not for an audience of 20. Not for an audience of, excuse me, 120. Not for an audience of 1,000. Not for an audience of 2,000. He's in it for an audience of one. That's the ambition of a godly leader. Okay, so now let's ask this question. What does this look like in the heart? As we move from the, 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 the character, now let's look at more of what's going on in this guy's heart. How does this play out? It's the idea of moving beyond the skill sets into the heart of the man. Well, the, on your little sheet there, it's going to ask the question, what are the attributes? We go from the ambition to the attributes of a godly leader. Um, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry was a... Novelist, a French novelist, the early 20th century. He was a famous French uh, war hero during World War II. He was killed in World War II. He wrote many books, many plays. Uh, he said this, If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather them. Divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. So what we're now moving from is Paul has just explained his ambition, and now we're going to move from the the physical, the, the, the the what what's going on behind, what's going on in the man, and now we're going to look at his affections. What's his affections? What is he longing for? What is this godly leader when when he steps into the game? What just happens? And that's what you're going to see here in verse seven and eight. So look at verse seven. The first thing you see is a godly leaders are compassionate. He says, but we approve, excuse me, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own young. This is the attributes of a godly leader. Again, he's not in it for himself. He's not, uh, all the things that he just said, a list of things, don't do this, don't do this. We're not in it for deceitfulness. We're not in it for fraud. We're not in it for fame. Like a nursing mother, now, I don't know about you, but uh, it's not, he, he doesn't just give the illustration of a mother. He, it's a mother doing a specific job, right? Nursing her child. What's on the heart and mind of that they're, they're nursing their child? Is it themselves? Is it their own, uh, what they're getting out of this? No, because it's painful, it's not comfortable. It takes up time. They have to stop. They have to give it. It's giving. It's sacrificial. 
He says, we came to you with gentleness, with compassion, like a nursing mother. That's the illustration that he gives. That's the attribute here. And keep going. Look in verse 8. He takes it a step further. From compassion, now he's going to step into the world of relationships. You're going to see that godly leaders are relational leaders. Look at this. Having so fond an affection. In other words, our compassion, our love for you is so great. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel. Stop. See, a lot of us, I think, believe that, well, the word of God, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that's the goal, that's the purpose, that's the end. That's where we stop. I, I, I'm here because of the gospel to tell you about the gospel. He says, wait, wait, wait. That's, that's not the whole picture. We, yes, we want to impart the gospel to you because we love you so much, but we not just that. We want to go beyond just words. And look at what he says. Not only to just, not only becomes the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become so dear to us. See, when Paul entered into Philippi and he met Lydia, it wasn't just, uh, she wasn't just an object or a goal to be sought. Check that off my list. Got one in, you know, notch on my, on my gun barrel there. I got her. She's now a Christian. Oh, here's this little slave girl. Got her. She's a Christian. They're not objects. The world is not an... We don't go into this world to share Christ, to be the light the hand of Christ, the, the hands of Christ, the feet of Christ, the, the ministry of the gospel. We don't, we're not about that just so that we can go, I got one. They're not targets to be had. You're not a target for me. I don't share my life with you. We're not going to lunch here in just a few minutes just so that I can gain your favor. It's because I want to know you. I want to spend time with you. This is the mark of godly leadership. We, as the church, have to at some level adopt a relational philosophy to our ministry, right? Now he's going to ask the final question as we get into these last few verses. So we've looked at the ambitions of a leader, we looked at the attributes of a leader. Now let's look at how this plays out. What are the behaviors, the actions of a godly leader in this world? Look at how Paul interacts with, these, with the church at Thessalonica. The first thing you see is the gospel. He's going to proclaim the word. He says this, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim the gospel of God. I don't know if you guys know this about Paul, but Paul, in his travels, he did receive donations. He was paid by several churches, and the church at Jerusalem gathered funds for him, the church at Antioch. And we see later on that the church at Philippi, they did a lot to supply his needs. But he also was a tent maker. He also had a job that put money in his pocket so that he didn't have to be burdened. Uh, he didn't have to burden these new believers, Okay? I don't know if you know this, but the rabbinical teachers of their time, the rabbis, they were paid, but they also had a trade. They were paid, but they also had something to do. This was a custom. And he's trying to show you, I'm not any different. And we came to you proclaiming the gospel. Look at the second thing that you see here is, is they were living as examples. It wasn't like what they were saying wasn't matching their life. There was not a hypocrisy, but there were examples being laid. The actions matched the words. I proclaim the gospel and then you saw it in us. Look at the text in verse 10. You are witness, blameless, and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behaved towards you, the believer. Have you ever met an, another Christian, maybe in leadership, who didn't treat people well? Who didn't who didn't act right. I almost put in here, instead of a, an example, I almost put in here righteously. I know that I've been guilty of this. There's been times in my life when, we were talking about this early this morning. I, I, this morning I got up and I had to go to the store. And as I went to the store, I was passing people coming up to the church. And I don't pay attention on the road. So, I mean, I could have had my finger in my nose. There's no telling what, I, what you saw when you see me on the road. But there's so often I'm not in a frame of mind of, oh, I need to be leading, or oh, I'm an example, or oh, or people are watching me. 
I'm, there's so many times in my life where I'm so not self-aware. Do you know what I mean by self-aware? Self-awareness is the idea that when I step in, I recognize that, that something is actually, that how I'm coming across to the world says something. And I have to be aware of that. If my fly is open, I have to be aware of that. Because this could be offensive, right? There's a booger in my beard. I need to know that. See me. It's also how I act. If you ever pass me in the car, you're going to see me I'm drumming. I like to drum in the car. We forget that we're supposed to be examples. It's, yeah, we're going to share the gospel. You should be sharing the gospel with your neighbor, with your coworkers, with your friends, with your family. You should be telling them about the hope that Christ has put in you. But beyond that, you know what speaks louder than just you talking about the gospel? is your example of it in your own life. And beyond that, as he moves into the very last thing into verses 11 and 12, you're going to see that godly leaders, uh, not only are they, they speaking the gospel, they're examples of the gospel, but there's a specific thing that comes out. And I think this is the telltale sign of a man and a woman of God. And it's they become encouragers. They become encouragers. Can I, can I just tell you that I get the privilege of being able to talk to a lot of you, especially when you're going through stuff. When you're struggling, sometimes I'm the first person you call. Praise God, I want that. You want to know what I find oftentimes when I'm talking with people? Is I don't, I don't have a clue what to say. Have I ever shared this with you before? I felt like I have. How many times I'll get into a situation and go, oh, I'm so far over my head right now. This is ridiculous. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I start praying. I start asking God to, ah, Lord, please give me something to tell this person. What do I say? You probably have noticed that. If you met with me, you're like, yeah, Chris is an idiot. He, he never gives me anything good. But you want to know what I've found more than anything? What most people need in their life is encouragement. It's weird. I was talking with... Uh, Somebody this week, and we were talking, I was talking about how one of the things that I find most fascinating, just most fascinating, is how the body of Christ responds to me when I say, hey, let's go get some coffee. Or when I say, or, or let's just say after a Bible study or after church, I want to talk. I'm back here hanging out. I'm inviting you to come. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Tell me about your grandmother. Tell me about your dad. What's happening here? It floors people. And I don't get it. I'm like, wait, why does that floor people? And I figured it out. Because this is what most people need. Just that slight interaction of how are you doing? What's going on? Hey, man, tell me about your kids. Hey, didn't you have this thing going down last week? How did that go? Church, if we take the slightest little lesson, if you walk away from anything is that the church bears this burden in this world more than anything. To step into the life of another person and just to encourage them. It's going to be okay. You know what the great thing about that is, when you're, especially when you're speaking to somebody who doesn't know Jesus? Most people live with such little encouragement in their life. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for light. You got gobs of it. You've got torches and, and flashlights. You've got floodlights. You've got the little bar across the Jeep. That's you. Christ in you is full of light. And you're that little beam, that city on a hill out there. Look at the text with me. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own kid. He brings back this, this concept as a father would his own kids, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. See, I think, I think that a lot of us need to really begin to wrestle with this idea. We talk a lot about the mission of the Lord, of the gospel here, that like I said, our church, that you are on mission, that you've been put here for a reason. And I want you to understand that, like I said from the very beginning, you're 
You're going to follow. You're going to have to follow somebody. But did you know, wherever you are, that there's a great chance that God has put you there to be the leader? To be the one person that is going to stand up and, and be a difference in the lives of the people around you? Whether it's at your home. Some of you realize that when you step into your home, you're the light. You're the only light of Christ in, that, in, your, in your home. What about your neighborhood? You may look at the, your, your neighbors on your right, your left, behind you, in front of you, across the street. You may live in a neighborhood where nobody knows Jesus. Did you know that you're the leader there? What about your work? You go to work with people who sometimes are very discouraging, tough to be around because of their... They don't know Christ. Maybe there's Christians there and they're acting like the ones who don't. You know what you are? You're the leader. What about in our government? What about in this city? What about in our, our political sphere? It's all the same, right? Home, or the community, work, government. We are the church, you and I, the people of God. And that means that we are the leaders. We're the leaders in our world. Amen? Let's take it. Let's take that mantle.